Hello everyone, my name is Dustin Schwab and I'm a career development specialist here at Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, which we refer to as OOD. Today I am co-hosting with my colleague Julie Wood and we'd like to welcome you to the Employer's Reasonable Accommodation Handbook six-part webinar series for the first session titled Intellectual Disabilities. Julie, can you please introduce yourself? Sure, thank you Dustin and hello everyone. We appreciate you joining us today. My name is Julie Wood and I am OOD's Worksite Accessibility Specialist. I'm also an occupational therapist and a certified ADA coordinator. My main role at the agency is to provide education for employers on creating inclusive and accessible workplaces, which includes talking about the guidelines under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA and identifying ideas to consider for reasonable accommodations and certainly sharing best practices and guidance for making the workplace accessible. And so I am happy to be here today with Dustin to begin this webinar series. Thank you, Julie. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that today's training comes with a learner's guide and a helpful fact sheet, which can be accessed now through the link that is posted in the Q&A section here in Microsoft Teams. Just as a remember, Reminder, the information that we share in these resources and during today's conversation is for educational purposes only and is not legal advice, but we do hope this information is helpful for you. We will be stopping about halfway through today's presentation and again before we conclude to answer questions. So please post your questions in the Q&A section at any time throughout the presentation so that they're ready for us when we stop. Julie, would you like to address the accessibility practices we have included in today's webinar? That's a great idea. When we create our training materials, we plan for accessibility up front. For example, we use the accessibility checker that is built into Microsoft 365 to review the accessibility of the learner's guide, fact sheet, and PowerPoint. We pay attention to color contrast, font size, and we make sure to add alternative text to any visual images in these materials. Also, in our delivery today, you will notice that Dustin and I mention each other by name as the conversation between us goes back and forth. We do this intentionally so the audience is aware of who is speaking. This can be helpful when attendees are receiving this information through services like American Sign Language Interpretation and live captioning. And after the webinar, we edit the transcript and fix any captioning errors before archiving the webinar in our on-demand library. Taking just a few intentional steps up front can make this presentation more accessible and inclusive for everyone. Julie, this is the first webinar in our Employer's Reasonable Accommodation Handbook series. Can you describe the purpose of the handbook? Sure, the handbook will highlight what is unique about various types of disabilities to help employers feel more knowledgeable when creating disability inclusive workplaces and providing reasonable accommodations. We've grouped disabilities into five categories and we'll present a webinar for each that will include an overview of the disability group, some ideas for disability etiquette and awareness, and we'll identify ways to effectively provide reasonable accommodations. Our sixth and final session will bring this information together with a focus on what you can ask, what you should do, and why. So employers feel better equipped to create workplaces that are inclusive of all employees, including employees with any type of disability. Thank you, Julie. So today we are going to focus on intellectual disabilities. What all will we discuss? Dustin, we will talk about what intellectual and developmental disabilities are because these are often referred to together. We'll talk about ways to create a disability inclusive culture by sharing some disability etiquette and awareness tips. And then we will discuss what is unique about providing reasonable accommodations specific to intellectual disabilities. And of course, we will share examples of reasonable accommodations. And throughout this series, Julie and I will share employment stories to illustrate the concepts that are discussed in these webinars. Our first story today is about Matthew and was shared in the OOD Works newsletter on December 10th, 2021. Matthew has Down syndrome, and after completing the requirements to finish high school, he was hired to work at Wendy's in New Albany, Ohio, as a lobby attendant and a kitchen assistant. According to his supervisor, Matthew is an incredibly hard worker with great endurance who inspires everyone around him. He already excelled in his interpersonal skills with his beloved customers and coworkers. 
In a short amount of time, Matthew's responsibilities at Wendy's were increased to help with cooking in the kitchen. Justin, Matthew shared that he loves cooking and sitting down to a free meal at the end of his shift, and he is using his income to save up for a new cell phone. I share his love of cooking and can relate to sitting down to a good meal at the end of my workday too. Yeah, I certainly would not hate finishing work and being able to indulge in some French fries. Julie, Down syndrome is a type of developmental disability that often includes an intellectual disability. Can you explain the difference between the two? Sure, Dustin. Developmental disability is a category of disabilities that can impact a person's physical, emotional, and or cognitive development. And intellectual disability is a type of developmental disability. And because of that, the two are grouped together. Developmental disabilities occur before the age of 22 when a person is still developing and are a result of a mental or physical impairment. These types of disabilities are often lifelong and substantially limit three or more major life activities, such as mobility, language, and learning. Now, while an intellectual disability is considered a developmental disability, not all developmental disabilities impact a person's cognitive or intellectual development. Some impact a person's physical or emotional development. Cerebral palsy is an example of this because it might present itself physically, but not intellectually. We will discuss physical disabilities in greater detail in next month's webinar. So today our focus is to better understand intellectual disabilities. That's right, Dustin. So an intellectual disability presents during a person's developmental period and can be caused by physical, genetic, or social factors. It can also be a result of a head injury, a stroke, an illness, or an unknown cause. It impacts a person's intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior. Julie, can you explain some skills relevant to the workplace that might be impacted by an intellectual disability? Yes, to do that, I'll explain what is meant by intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior. Intellectual functioning it refers to a person's general mental capacity, so it includes things like learning, reasoning, and problem solving. Adaptive behavior involves conceptual, social, and practical skills that a person learns and then applies to their daily activities. So conceptual skills are things like language and literacy, concepts that involve money, time, and numbers, and self-direction. Some examples of social skills include interpersonal skills, self-esteem, social problem solving, and the ability to follow rules. And practical skills are things like personal care skills, occupational skills, travel and transportation, schedules and routines, safety, and the use of a telephone. Now, I just listed many ways an intellectual disability can impact a person, however, while an individual may experience some of these, it would be rare to experience all of them, and the degree to which a person is impacted varies. And just like all people, people with intellectual disabilities have unique abilities, strengths, and skills. So how a person may be impacted in the workplace will be unique. Thank you, Julie. So don't forget about Matthew, we will be referring to him more, but now we are going to move on to disability inclusion in the workplace, and we have another story that we would like to share. This story is about destiny and was featured in an OOD Works newsletter on May 6th, 2022. Destiny completed a transition program with Dayton Public Schools in 2021. At that time, she was ready to work in the community. Like Matthew, Destiny likes cooking, and in a short amount of time, she found a job working with one of OOD's employer partners, the University of Dayton, in their dining hall. Dustin, when she started her job, Destiny worked with a job coach to identify tools to assist with performing work tasks. Tools like job boards that show the work process to help with keeping up with food orders, laminated charts to keep track of stock, and timers to support task management. Destiny said she was so excited to get hired because this was the type of job she always dreamed of. Julie, I like those strategies that Destiny uses to stay organized, particularly the board to keep track of her orders. Like her, I used to use a big whiteboard to keep track of what I needed to remember each day when I was in a previous job. They really work for her too, Dustin. Her supervisor said, Destiny has a great personality, is a hard worker, and she couldn't ask for a better employee. The team members really appreciate her being there. 
Julie, I think this story demonstrates the importance of utilizing best practices to include individuals with disabilities in the workplace. Both Destiny and Matthew have Down syndrome, which is frequently an obvious disability. Some intellectual disabilities, though, are not apparent and are referred to as invisible. This may play a factor in a person's choice to disclose their disability at work because they wish to keep their disability private. Another benefit to creating an inclusive culture is that individuals with disabilities may feel more comfortable to disclose their disability and request a reasonable accommodation if they need one. Dustin, that's correct. Choosing to disclose and request a reasonable accommodation can be a difficult choice because, like you said, some people prefer to keep information about their disability private, and that's okay. But if an individual does need an accommodation to access the hiring process or perform the job, you want them to feel comfortable to ask for what they need. I am going to share some ways employers can foster a culture where individuals feel more comfortable to request an accommodation if they need one. One idea is to train all employees on your reasonable accommodation policy and how to make a request. To make this accessible for individuals with an intellectual disability, you could consider using training materials that are written clearly, concisely, and use plain language. Another idea is to make it easy to request a reasonable accommodation. According to the ADA, a request can be made in a person's preferred form of communication, and it can be in plain language, meaning it does not have to reference the ADA or the term reasonable accommodation. So it's okay if you have a request form, just don't require someone to use it and be prepared to receive a request in a variety of ways, like in an email, a phone call, or a conversation. And then train your supervisors on how to recognize a request. Often an individual will ask their supervisor for what they need, and because it can be subtle, having supervisors trained to recognize a request and know what steps to take can help to ensure individuals with disabilities have what they need at work. Another way to foster an inclusive workplace is to provide disability etiquette and awareness training for all employees, which we will discuss later, but this can help all employees feel more confident when interacting with colleagues with disabilities and can then help make everyone feel included. Julie, stereotypes and fears some people have about certain types of disabilities can also impact them in the hiring process. That's correct. Often the biggest barrier to employment for an individual with a disability is not a limitation they have, but the limiting beliefs and opinions others have about the person's disability. So how about you share some misconceptions or myths and I'll provide the facts. Great idea. One myth is that an intellectual disability is almost always severe. Dustin, 85% of individuals with an intellectual disability have mild intellectual impairment, which does not limit getting an education or performing a job. How about a belief that people with an intellectual disability all behave in the same way? Dustin, people with and without disabilities are unique individuals with their own abilities, limitations, preferences, dislikes, hopes, and goals. So all of us behave in our own unique way. Another myth is that vocational or career training is not suitable for people with intellectual disabilities. Dustin, these types of trainings can benefit individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities to prepare for interviews, perform the job, obtain soft skills, and communicate at work. How about this one? People with intellectual disabilities want to be pitied and given special attention. Dustin, individuals with and without disabilities may at times seek attention. People with developmental and intellectual disabilities want what everyone wants, and that is to be treated with respect and dignity, and contrary to the myth, do not want or need special treatment. And one last misconception, employees with intellectual disabilities need a significant amount of extra training. Dustin, all employees bring their own unique learning style to a training, and individuals with intellectual disabilities are no different. Some may not need any accommodations at all to successfully complete the training, while others may benefit from peer support or a few modifications, like providing oral instruction rather than written. Thank you, Julie, for helping us get to the truths about these misconceptions. One important way employers can help to overcome the potential barrier these can create is to provide disability etiquette and awareness training. You also mentioned this training can help foster a disability inclusive workplace. 
I think it would be helpful to share some general disability etiquette tips. Justin, I agree. We have four simple rules to share. The first is show respect. Remember that people with disabilities are people first, so concentrate on the person and not the disability. The next tip is be courteous. This includes respecting a person's personal space as well as the reasonable accommodations they may use to perform the job. Another helpful tip is don't assume. Each person is a unique individual with limitations and abilities. It's important to not assume what a person can or cannot do and instead let the person decide what they can do. And the final tip is ask first. If you think a person needs assistance, don't assume what they need and automatically provide that help. Just ask the person if they need help and if they do, ask how you can help. Julie, your first tip was to show respect. Maybe we could share some examples of ways to interact with people with intellectual disabilities in a respectful manner. Sure, one tip that can be helpful that we've mentioned earlier is to use plain language, which is direct, clearly communicated, and concise. And is also free of slang terminology or jargon. Also, be patient and comfortable with a break in the conversation. It may take a person with an intellectual disability a bit longer to process what was said and formulate a response. And if you are asked to repeat a question, try to ask your question in another way. It may also be helpful to write the question down or use images. Your next suggestion was to be courteous. And to be courteous, I think it's helpful to be aware of preferred terminology and to avoid language that may be hurtful or offensive to a person with a disability. I agree, Dustin. Sometimes a term that may have been acceptable in the past evolves to take on a negative or hurtful meaning. For example, words like crippled, dumb, the R word, or afflicted are hurtful, so avoid using these words. And instead of referring to an individual as handicapped, say person with a disability. Or if you are referring to a component of the environment, such as parking, instead of saying handicapped parking, say accessible parking. Thank you, Julie. So I think this is a good time to see what questions have come in from the audience. And just so everyone knows, we did get some questions that were pre-submitted with the registration form when, when it was filled out. And so we'll be uh, using some of those questions as we go through the questions in the Q&A box. So Julie, one of the questions that was submitted ahead of time is they uh, someone asked who to have these conversations with and how to openly talk about them. Um, thank you, Dustin. So when we received this question, we um, we are we were thinking this is about fostering a disability inclusive workplace. And so there's kind of two answers to this. First, how you encourage or foster this environment is sharing information and talking with everybody. So providing that disability etiquette and awareness training helps everybody to feel more comfortable inter interacting with colleagues. Um, Another way that you can help to foster this type of environment is to provide training on your reasonable accommodation policy, inform everybody of how to make a request, use that reasonable accommodation statement that we talk about a lot, make sure it's posted in key places. That really does go a long way in helping individuals to feel comfortable to ask for what they need um, if they encounter a barrier in the workplace. Um, another idea is to remember to include images of people with disability on your website and in your marketing materials. If you have newsletters that um, share informational topics for your employees, make sure some of those topics are related to disability. So all of these components can help to foster an environment where fe people feel included and comfortable to ask for what they need. And then when somebody does ask for what they need, those conversations happen directly with the individual during your interactive process to kind of work together to find out what they do need in the workplace. So I hope that helps answer that question. Yeah, thanks, Julie. And we just wanted to mention too that um, we can help provide some of this disability etiquette and awareness training at your organizations. Um, if anyone is interested in some further training, um, you can reach out to the business relations specialist in your area and they can help set you up with some of that training. All right, Julie, another question. Um, when so much of hiring is based on interviews and thinking on your feet and having a feel for how a candidate might fit well within to a team, how can those with intellectual disabilities or maybe autism secure a job offer in order to request accommodations for their disability or for their neurodiverse condition? Yeah, 
Thank you. And I, I appreciate this question and I, I understand what it's what it's getting at. And I think there's there's two parts to this answer. Um, first of all, my role is to help educate employers, but I think for those who um, work with individuals with disabilities for their job goals, it's important to remember to educate individuals on their rights and responsibilities related to reasonable accommodations. And so um, to let individuals know they can ask for accommodations for the interview process so they don't have to wait until they're hired and have the job to ask for the accommodation. And if what can help a person in that interview to be able to um, respond to a question, you know, part of this question was saying think on your feet and in an interview, that's what we're doing, right? We're thinking quickly to formulate a response to the question we're asked. Um, you know, an example of an accommodation could be to ask for additional time during the interview so that the person has time to receive the information, formulate a response and then respond to the question. Um, a person could also, if they need this related to their disability, ask for questions in advance or to ask for questions to be provided in a written format. That way they have those to refer to after they've been asked the question. So I think that's part one of that answer. But for the employers that are with us today, just going back to all of the things we talked about, um, fostering that disability inclusive workplace will help you to already have those tactics in place, like the reasonable accommodation statement, the reasonable accommodation process. So you're ready if that accommodation request comes in to take it and provide the accommodations for both the interview and on the job. So I hope that helps to answer that question. Great, thank you. And I think to another accommodation that, especially with um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, that is kind of common in the interview process is maybe having a job developer to sit in on an interview with someone and help help um, them understand the questions that are being asked of them that might help when they're thinking on their feet. Um, and we're going to discuss job coaches and job developers in a little bit. So that's a preview for what's coming up. Um, so we did get a question in the Q&A box, Julie. To what degree do we request or insist on getting medical documentation to support a reasonable accommodation request? That's a good question. We're going to talk about that here shortly in the um, as we continue the presentation, but um, to just provide a short answer right now is that, you know, if the disability is obvious, the ADA says we can't ask for documentation as an employer, but if it's not obvious, you know, you have the right to know somebody has a disability so you can request documentation. Um, same goes with the need for the accommodation. So maybe the disability itself is obvious, but why the accommodation is needed is not. And so uh, that's how you approach documentation. If things are obvious to you, then you don't ask for the documentation. And when they're not, you can ask for limited, reasonable documentation to support what you need about the disability in the workplace. So you would never ask for an entire medical record, but. Sounds like uh, someone intuited your answer because in the Q&A box since then, uh, they've said they've made accommodations simply on observance, such as have someone ha who has an artificial leg and also on the appearance of Down syndrome. So absolutely. Sounds like people are implementing that suggestion. Great. So I think those are all the questions that we have right now. Um, again, Julie and I will stop before the end of today's presentation to answer any more questions. So feel free to keep putting them in the Q&A box and we'll be happy to get to them before we're finished. Uh, okay, now Julie, on to our next story. And this story was published in the June 3rd, 2020-22 OOD Works newsletter. And it's about Zach who graduated high school in May, 2021. He has a developmental disability while in high school, he completed a certified nursing technician pro certified nursery technician program. And after graduation, he was hired by Walmart in Kenton, Ohio to stock shelves overnight. When he began his job, he worked with the job coach to familiarize himself with the handheld scanner that helped him find the location of merchandise for the store. Since then, Zach has been promoted to a position in the maintenance department at Walmart and works full time. Dustin, Zach also uses his horticulture skills to help Walmart with the landscaping. He says he likes to work because it makes him like everyone else and hopes to one day be the boss of maintenance. Julie, I like that Zach talks about his hopes to grow in his job. So no one would ever trust me to supervise a maintenance team, but I surely relate to his desire to, to be a leader. Now, Julie, we're discussing Zach's story at this point in the webinar because we are going to discuss reasonable accommodations. We mentioned an accommodation that helped Zach, which is job coaching. Perfect timing, Dustin. Let's do a quick review first. A reasonable accommodation is a change in the way something is customarily done to enable an individual with a disability to access the hiring process, perform the job's essential functions, and or 
enjoy the privileges of employment. And we will share examples, but before we do, it's helpful to remember that not all individuals with disabilities, including individuals with intellectual disabilities, need accommodations. However, when an accommodation is needed, the solution is always unique to the individual, the job, and the employer. And good news, most reasonable accommodations are free, and those that are not are typically, they typically cost an average of $500. So Julie, obtaining a reasonable accommodation generally begins with a request from the individual. That's right. An individual with a disability can request a reasonable accommodation at any time by telling the employer they need a change in the hiring process or at work because of their disability or medical condition. This request can be from an individual's family member, friend, medical provider, or other representative. Like we said earlier, the request can be made in the individual's preferred form of communication, which could be through a phone call, an in-person conversation, or in written form like an email. And as a reminder, the request can use plain language, which means the individual does not have to reference the Americans with Disabilities Act or the term reasonable accommodation. Julie, one thing that we didn't mention about Zach from the story we shared is that he is a man of few words. Therefore, it makes sense that the way he communicates a need for an accommodation may be different than someone who is more talkative. You also mentioned that others can request accommodations for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Will you share a couple of examples? Sure, Dustin. I have two examples from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC. In the first, an individual with an obvious intellectual disability is applying for a job at a retail store. The manager gives him the application form and he tells the manager he needs someone to assist him with the application. This is a request for a reasonable accommodation. In the second example, a store clerk with Down syndrome is having problems on the job and his job coach requests a meeting with the supervisor to discuss possible solutions. This is a request for a reasonable accommodation. Julie, what if an employer notices that an employee with a disability is struggling with a work task? Does the employer have a responsibility to assist in some way? There are times an employer has an obligation to ask an employee if they need a reasonable accommodation, even if the employee has not requested one. This obligation occurs when all three of these circumstances are true. First, the employer knows the employee has a disability, Second, the employer knows the employee is having difficulty at work related to their disability. And third, the employer knows the disability prevents the individual from asking for a reasonable accommodation. So here's an, an example of this from the EEOC. An employee with an intellectual disability works in a flower shop. Her duties include stocking containers in the refrigerator with flowers. Each type of flower goes into a specific container and each container goes into a specific location in the refrigerator. The employee often misplaces the flowers and the containers. The employer knows the employee has an intellectual disability, suspects the performance problem is related to the disability, and knows the employee is unable to ask for an accommodation because of the disability. So the employer asks the employee about the misplaced items and asks if it would be helpful to label the containers and the refrigerator shelves. The employee says yes. So as a reasonable accommodation, the employer labels the containers and refrigerator shelves with the appropriate flower name or picture. What's great about this change is it can help minimize errors and increase productivity for all employees. Good point, Julie. So that brings us to the interactive process. Let's talk about what might be unique for employers when they start when they're navigating this process with individuals with intellectual disabilities. How about we start with documentation? Sure, Dustin. Just for another quick review, the interactive process is the term for the collaboration that occurs between the individual requesting an accommodation and the employer as they work together to identify an effective solution. As the employer begins this process, they are permitted to verify the person has a disability. And in general, like we said before, when the disability and or the need for the accommodation are not obvious, the employer can request documentation to verify the disability and or to identify the need for the accommodation. But when the disability is obvious, the employer can only request documentation if it's needed to identify the limitations the person is experiencing at work related to the disability and why the accommodation is needed. 
In the learner's guide, we included a link to a medical inquiry form from the Job Accommodation Network, known as JAN, as an example for employers who want to create a form of their own. Julie, let's review how the ADA defines disability because it can be different from other entities and laws. That's right. The ADA defines disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. A major life activity is a daily function that is important to most people and that most people in the general population can perform with little or no difficulty. These include functions like seeing, hearing, walking, speaking, learning, concentrating, communicating, and many others. How an individual's intellectual disability impacts major life activities will be unique to each person. Major life activities also include major bodily functions, like the functions of the immune system, digestive system, nervous system and brain, and the musculoskeletal system. So the major bodily function that's impacted with intellectual disabilities is brain functioning. Now, employers often ask if the ADA provides a list of disabilities that automatically qualify a person as having a disability, and the answer is no. However, the ADA does have a list of disabilities that should be easily concluded to be a disability, and intellectual disability is on that list. So that's important to be aware of when an employer is deciding whether to obtain documentation. That is helpful. Thank you, Julie. The next step in the process is to identify accommodation solutions. So you mentioned earlier an intellectual disability might cause limitations in functions like learning, problem solving, and thinking, or with conceptual skills, social skills, and practical skills. What types of accommodations are used to overcome barriers related to these skills? Dustin, there are several types of accommodations employers can consider, like making the work environment accessible, restructuring a job, permitting a flexible schedule, providing or altering equipment and services, altering supervisory methods, modifying policies, and providing reassignment. Now, during the interactive process, it's helpful to remember two things. First, an employee with a disability often knows what they need as an accommodation. So asking the employee first is a great way to start. Second, I know I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. What an individual needs as a reasonable accommodation is always unique to the individual, the job, and the employer. So it's always determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's go back to our story about Zach. He utilized a job coach when he started working at Walmart. Providing a job coach is an example of modifying a policy, like a training policy, as a form of reasonable accommodation. Dustin, this is a common accommodation for people with developmental and intellectual disabilities, and I know you used to supervise job coaches, so will you tell us how this is an effective accommodation? Yeah, sure, Julie. A uh, job coach might assist in several different situations, so a new employee might benefit from additional training, an existing employee might be given a new task or a promotion, or a current employee might be struggling to meet performance standards. In any of these situations, a job coach could collaborate with the employer to train the employee to work independently. Now, job coaching can be, a benefic can be beneficial for employees with disabilities and for their employers. Job coaches ensure the employee is meeting the organization's standards. They help identify further accommodations that are cost effective, when appropriate, and they utilize naturally occurring supports within the job site. Justin, there are additional ways training policies can be modified, and these can be enhanced with job coaching. One idea is to permit additional training time, which may include utilizing a job coach to supplement the customary training provided by the employer. Another idea is to create alternative training materials, which a job coach can help identify, and one last idea is to permit the natural support of a coworker to be a mentor to the employee. Julie, you explained how an accommodation request may come from a member of an employee's uh, support team. Job coaching is an accommodation that is commonly requested by someone other than the employee. The job coach might even help the employee request further accommodations. That's right, Dustin. And just as a reminder, not all employees with intellectual disabilities need a job coach, but when it is needed, job coaching is an effective accommodation. Great. 
So let's talk about other accommodations that might be useful. What are some examples of how to make the work environment accessible for individuals with intellectual disabilities? Justin, I have ideas for the hiring process and the workplace. For the hiring process, one idea is to divide a panel style interview into individual interviews. Another is to provide interview questions to the candidate in advance. An interviewer could use a demonstration rather than a description to illustrate a job task. And a final idea is to allow a job developer or a job coach to be present during the interview. An idea to make the workplace accessible is to relocate the workstation away from noisy or high traffic areas to minimize audio and visual distractions so the employee can focus on work. Julie, how can an employer restructure a job? Restructuring the job refers to performing the job's essential functions in another way or removing or swapping the marginal functions. Some examples include using task management tools to support memory, like a checklist or a flowchart, a calendar for meetings, and maps of the work environment. Another idea is to provide information in both written and picture form to communicate instructions for a task. And using reminder apps on smart devices for scheduled breaks or to remember to stop one task and begin the next. What is great about these accommodations is there can be many ways to provide these, such as an app on a smart device, a feature of a program or a system you already have, and through job aids that you create and place in the work environment, like a set of instructions that are placed directly where the task is performed. Julie, how can a flexible schedule be helpful for someone with an intellectual disability? We mentioned earlier that an individual with an intellectual disability may experience a limitation with practical skills involving transportation, routines, and schedules. Let's say an employee uses public transportation to commute to work and the arrival schedule is not in sync with the start of their shift. Permitting a flexible schedule that adjusts the start time can be an effective, reasonable accommodation. An employee may also need to alter their schedule to attend a medical appointment. I have an example of an employee who works as a grocery store clerk and needs to attend a counseling appointment once a week during work hours. As a reasonable accommodation, the employer permitted a modified work schedule that allows the employee to leave two hours early on the day of the appointment and make up the time by starting work two hours early another day. Another idea is to permit a modified break schedule. This can be helpful when a person needs a longer break to manage medical needs, like taking medication at scheduled times. And so as an accommodation, an employer may combine two smaller breaks into a larger one. That makes sense. Julie, will you share some ideas of what equipment and services are available? Yes, we discussed restructuring a job task by using an app for reminders or a checklist. To complement this, an employer may provide the employee with a smart device so they can use these apps. To support memory, another helpful item is a smart pen, which operates like a pen, but it has a built-in recording device that stores the audio it hears, which can then be uploaded into a computer as written notes that can be referenced later, edited, and shared. Sometimes written materials like lengthy instructions can be more easily referenced if they are color coded or if a person can place a color contrast overlay on top of the written materials. As we've mentioned, job coaching is an example of a service that can be provided. This is often used during onboarding to help a new employee learn and become independent in performing work tasks, but can also be effective when new tasks are introduced to the job. Another service is to provide someone to assist with interpreting an application form for an applicant that has a limitation with understanding complex information. Julie, the final type of reasonable accommodation we have examples for is altering supervisory methods. Does this mean an employer has to change a person's supervisor as a reasonable accommodation? Employers are not required to change an employee's supervisor as a form of reasonable accommodation, but they can if they wish. What the EEOC guidance suggests is to consider altering a supervisory method as a form of reasonable accommodation. An example of this is a supervisor changing the frequency of how often they meet with an employee or following up in-person meetings with written notes, like through an email that highlights important information. 
When giving instructions, the supervisor may need to deliver information using plain language and at a slower pace to give the employee time to receive and process the information. OK, Julie, so we have another story to share. This one was published in an OOD Works newsletter in March 2022 about a person named Cole. Cole has an intellectual disability caused by a traumatic brain injury or TBI when he was 14. After three brain surgeries and years of therapy, he graduated high school and began college. In 2020, he graduated from Bowling Green State University with a degree in construction management. He was then hired as an assistant estimator for Loveland Excavating and Paving in Fairfield, Ohio. Justin, according to the article, Cole says his coworkers genuinely care about him and recognize that he has cognitive challenges. Cole says he feels his coworkers are understanding and supportive. I like that you brought that part up because I have had many caring and supportive coworkers who have helped me get through both personal and professional challenges too. So speaking of coworkers, they are central to the next portion of our discussion, which is on confidentiality. Julie, how should employers ensure confidentiality for someone who has disclosed a disability? The personal and medical information an employer obtains when an individual discloses a disability and requests a reasonable accommodation is subject to the confidentiality criteria provided by the EEOC. Their guidance states that this information should be kept in separate medical files that are apart from general personnel files, whether they are stored electronically or in physical filing cabinets. Julie, is there information the employer can share with coworkers? There are times that certain information can be shared with designated parties. For example, employees who facilitate accommodations can know the person is receiving a reasonable accommodation, but they're only permitted to know the limited information necessary to implement the accommodation. They're not permitted to know the details about the disability, medical condition, or related limitations. These may be employees who work in facilities or IT or who help during emergency situations. The same is true for supervisors. A supervisor often needs to know an accommodation is being implemented to help facilitate the accommodation or to be aware of it, like when an employee is receiving a flexible schedule. But like the other example, they are not permitted to know detailed information about the employee's disability. In these examples, if there is a reason information related to the disability, beyond just the fact that an accommodation is being provided, is necessary for these parties in their role in the process, the employee receiving the accommodation should be informed first to make sure they're okay with this disclosure. Now, Julie, Cole mentioned that his coworkers are understanding and supportive, so likely his disability is apparent, but you mentioned earlier that 85% of intellectual disabilities are not severe. Therefore, many are probably not as apparent. What should employers do if they provide a reasonable accommodation and receive questions about it from the coworkers of an employee with a disability? Justin, it's important for employers to be prepared to respond because they will receive questions from employees who notice accommodations in the workplace. Knowing how to respond is key to adhering to the confidentiality protocol from the EEOC. First, we know the employer cannot respond by saying the individual has a disability. The employer can also not mention the individual is receiving a reasonable accommodation because that term is unique to the ADA and automatically discloses a person has a disability. So it's a best practice to prepare supervisors and the employees who implement reasonable accommodations with a response for these questions so they can respond in an appropriate way. What the EEOC suggests for consideration is responding with a statement that emphasizes that the employer's policy is to assist any employee who encounters difficulty at work and to explain these types of situations are personal and that the employer is required to follow confidentiality guidelines. The EEOC also suggests the employer reassure the coworker that his or her privacy would be respected similarly. One way to prevent these types of questions is to train all employees on the right to reasonable accommodation for individuals with disabilities. OK, let's talk about performance, conduct and safety. As we know, employees with disabilities are expected to perform the essential functions of their jobs with or without a reasonable accommodation. Dustin, that's correct. 
The point of a reasonable accommodation is to enable an individual with a disability to perform the job to the expected productivity and quality standards all employees are held to. So employers can expect all employees to be qualified to do the job. Now, an employer would generally assess all employees the same way to determine whether they are meeting these expectations. There are times when low performance is an employee's first indication to themselves that their disability is contributing to their work, and it can be common then for an employee to disclose a disability and request a reasonable accommodation. So if this occurs, the employer should begin the interactive process as they would with any request they receive. The employer is permitted to apply the consequences of low performance as they would apply to any employee with low performance in the same job class. This is because reasonable accommodation is prospective or future oriented. Julie, what if the employer suspects the employee's disability might be impacting their performance? Low performance is often unrelated to disability. However, an employer may ask an employee if their low performance is related to their disability when all three of these circumstances are true. First, the employer knows the employee has a disability. Second, the employer has observed the employee's low performance. And third, the employer reasonably believes the disability is contributing to the low performance. Is there anything you would like to share about employee conduct? Justin, employers can generally expect all employees, including employees with disabilities, to meet their conduct standards. If an employee with a disability violates a conduct rule and disability is not a contributing factor, the employer can apply the same consequences it would apply to any employee who broke the same rule. Now, when an employee responds to discipline, discipline for misconduct by disclosing a disability and requests a reasonable accommodation, the employer should begin the interactive process, just like we mentioned with performance. And the employer may apply the consequences for the misconduct as long as the conduct rule is job related and consistent with business necessity and it's equally applied to all employees. Julie Cole works in construction and he wears a hard hat in the picture that we used for him. This makes me think that safety might be a priority in his workplace. So what should employers do to ensure employees will be safe in their work environments? Thus, in employers are permitted to create a qualification standard that requires all employees not pose a direct threat in the workplace. A direct threat is a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of the individual or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced by reasonable accommodation. The EEOC guidance states an employer can ask an individual with an intellectual disability about their disability when they have a reasonable belief based on objective evidence that the employee may not be able to perform the job safely due to their disability. What's most important to know is that if an employer thinks a direct threat may exist, they cannot make this determination based on fears, myths, stereotypes, or generalizations. They must use the criteria that EEOC provides to assess the situation, which includes assessing the individual's knowledge, skills, experience, and ability to safely do the job, identifying the specific risk, showing the risk is current and not speculative or remote, performing an assessment based on objective evidence, and determining if the risk can be eliminated or reduced through a reasonable accommodation. An example from the EEOC guidance says an employer cannot deny an applicant with an intellectual disability a job preparing food in a restaurant kitchen based on an assumption that people with intellectual disabilities cannot use sharp knives without injuring themselves. To assess whether a direct threat exists, the employer must consider information from the applicant himself and or from an appropriate professional about the limitations imposed by the disability. And the employer should consider the applicant's training and or prior work experience and whether he has had any safety problems performing the work tasks similar to the position he is applying for. So as we conclude this section, remember that when a direct threat exists, an employer is required to consider whether a reasonable accommodation is available to eliminate or reduce the risk to an acceptable level. Thank you, Julie. OK, let's take one more break to see the questions that we have. Um, so the first question we received is, how do we connect a person to a job coach? So I'll share what I know, and Dustin, I know you might have some other ideas about sure. this, but um, 
For our employer partners, you're welcome to reach out to your business relations specialist to talk with them to help be connected to services here at Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. Um, in general, I have talked with employers before that when you're in the interactive process with any employee with a disability asking for an accommodation, um, you're welcome to mention our services. And if the individual would like to apply for services, which could help to identify and sometimes provide an accommodation in the workplace, um, they can do that. And we have a website, www.oodworks.com, uh, where a person could apply or again, they could, uh, there's a number they can call us as well. Don't remember that. Dustin, do you have any other ideas about how to connect with job coaches? You know, I think that's you hit on kind of the best okay. um, example that, that we have. Um, you know, if a person is coming to an interview with then they're using a job developer, then you may the job developer you might be able to talk to about potentially arranging a job coach. Um, and they might be able to help connect with OD services as well. Um, whatever support people um, you're involved with for the employee, they might be able to help connect with OOD services or other services available to the individual. So, uh, Julie, are job coaches provided by the potential employee or are employers ever asked to fund or provide a job coach outside of the normal mentoring slash training by current employees? No, so that answer is, um, you know, based on the unique situation. So at times the the employer, the candidate will have already coordinated these services. And so like Dustin mentioned, this might be a part of an interview. And so that kind of carries over into onboarding and it's it's provided outside of the employer. The employer's permitting it, but the employer's not paying for it. Um, there's times that OD can provide this service, maybe not ongoing or always, but um, so there are avenues where this is kind of coordinated and funded outside of the employer. I imagine there's times when, you know, employers have the obligation to provide reasonable accommodations. And so there might be times when that service is provided by the employer. Um, so it really would be a case by case answer for that question. Yeah, yeah. But um, when OOD provide, helps provide job coaching for an individual, OOD can um, provide the funding for that job coach. So if you uh, take that first answer and connect it to that second answer, um, that, that can hopefully help answer both of them. Um, so Julie, one of the pre-submitted questions that we have, um, if it is suspected that someone is having cognitive impairment demonstrated by a decline in performance, but the employee does not admit to it when performance is explored, is there anything else a manager can do to ensure the employee gets the help that they need? Yes, and the answer that I have for this would really be based on any disability that an employee has that you might um, that might be obvious that you might be aware of or you may know of as an employer. So, you know, there's times when any employee has low, low performance and as a supervisor or an employer, you're going to have a discussion with this employee. And so my recommendation is if nothing has been disclosed to you and no accommodations have been requested, keep your conversation on the job performance. As employers, you have productivity expectations and you have quality expectations. And um, I would have a conversation with the individual about how they're not meeting those expectations. Leave some time for them to answer. They might explain why they're having some performance deficits. Um, you might suggest some ways that um, you can work together or ask them, how can we help you and see what they say? They may have some ideas on how they can improve performance. They may not have anything to do with their disability, even though maybe you suspect that it could. So give them room to just explain what's going on. And if they still don't disclose and still don't ask for an accommodation, think about what you would offer any employee to help them improve their job performance and offer to them some ideas or strategy, whether it's additional training, a mentor, time management, applications on a smart device. You know, there's a variety of things that might help any employee in that same job. So suggest those and see what they say. Um, really, the disclosure of a disability and the request for an accommodation remains the um, obligation of the individual, um, unless there are the other parameters that we talked about earlier in the training. So that's how I would handle that. Great, and I think we have time for one last question. So Julie, uh, why would someone with a disability wait to request an accommodation? Why wouldn't they request it right away? Right, so we know the ADA says an individual with a disability can ask for a reasonable accommodation at any time during the hiring process or during employment. And the reason for that is not all people with disabilities need accommodations. When they need an accommodation, um, 
they, it, it's really meant for them to be comfortable to ask for it. So it's on their timetable. Uh, but sometimes a person doesn't need a, an accommodation until something changes and that change change change, excuse me, can occur in the workplace or with a disability. So a person might have a condition or a disability, but it's not interfering with work until maybe that condition progresses or something in the work environment changes. We've seen a lot of change with the pandemic, working from home and then returning to hybrid. So that's an example of a workplace changing and that might cause a person with a disability to need something. And so that's why a person's not waiting to ask for an accommodation. They may not need one, so they're asking when there's a change. The other reason a person may not ask is because they don't know enough yet about the hiring process or the job or the work environment to know that they need an accommodation. So when you invite somebody to an interview, if you can provide some detailed information about that interview or any testing, like if there's going to be a computer based test or a time limit to the interview, let them know that in your interview invitation and they'll better be informed of if they need an accommodation. Same with onboarding or when you're describing the job. So those are ways that you can help a person to be aware so if they need something and you include that reasonable accommodation statement in that information, they know they need something, they know they're invited to ask. Um, and so that's the best way to handle that. Yeah, great. I like that you mentioned that someone may not know that they need an accommodation. Um, as we've mentioned before, I work with college students with disabilities. And so a lot of the people that I work with, um, they're, you know, they might be graduating from college and their the job that they're going into might be the first like full time work experience that they've had. And so the accommodations that they've used in college, um, they might not feel like they need in the workplace and they might realize there are some some other accommodations that they might need. And so that might be another uh, answer to that question as well. That's a great point, Dustin. Thank you. And thank you all for your great questions. Um, Julie, as we conclude, we have one last story to summarize our discussion today. This story is about Haley. It was published in the OOD Works newsletter in March 2022. Haley has an intellectual disability, a nonverbal learning disability, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and anxiety. She has always loved animals and wanted a career where she could work with them. In May 2021, she interviewed online for a job at Red Dog Pet Resort and Spa in Mason, Ohio as a pet care specialist. From there, she was invited for a tour of the facility and then hired. She worked with a job coach to help master clocking into work and managing her time. Her supervisor stated that Haley is an employee with a great work ethic and attitude who gets along with her coworkers. Haley said her job makes her feel good about herself and she likes getting paid. She has taken, sim she has taken classes at Sinclair College to train to be a vet tech. Justin, that story touches on several of the things we discussed today. First, I think it's likely that Haley's employer took steps to make sure she felt included in the workplace. In the article, her supervisor described her as a great employee who gets along with her coworkers. Haley also commented that the job makes her feel good about herself. The story also mentions a successful, reasonable accommodation, job coaching. This is a great example of an accommodation that OOD can often provide at no cost. By finding an accommodation that worked for Haley, she was able to be successful in her job. Hopefully, this story and the others provide our employers with ideas to consider when they are in the interactive process and working with an individual to determine an effective solution. Thank you all for joining us today as we begin this new webinar series. 